In 2017, Haters Back Off aired its final episode, marking the end of a two-season series from Netflix featuring Miranda Sings, the self-involved aspiring singer created by Colleen Ballinger, who achieved breakout stardom on YouTube, and after the show's end, became just another name on the long list of content creators who made a successful jump into the mainstream, only to find that stream unfortunately becomes a tributary feeding into a fiery lake of failure to find an audience, which eventually deposits into a bay of bad reviews, before ultimately washing these once famous YouTubers out into the ocean of obscurity, just off an archipelago of their problematic behaviors. Yeah, I know a lot of geographical terms. A psychic once told me that it was my ancestor who helped explore the American West, as one of Sacagawea's most cowardly kidnappers. I'm not proud of the colonial part, I'm just excited to know what the word Bay means. A few weeks ago, we broke down the first episode of Haters Back Off to spot some of the red flags hiding behind Miranda Sings and her horrible red lips. And today, we will jump to the very end of the series for the final episode of season two to hopefully understand what sort of progress the show had made over its short run, while also getting a sense of how Colleen Ballinger and her production team lost the interest of most audience members and basically destroyed the confidence of Netflix. Netflix, who never again took the risk of giving a professionally produced show to a successful YouTuber, except for every year since then. So grab a wet wipe and start dissolving that cakey lip color and find out what happens in a series finale that feels more sad, less cohesive, and just about equally as cringeworthy when we get a load of Colleen Ballinger's original cancellation in this premium streaming installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we break it down like the line item budget of a TV show that just doesn't bring in the ratings it used to. So that we can look at each individual uh, scene and selection and clip and decide if this was worthy of the haters or if the whole world is wrong and we just have bad taste, which seems unlikely, but before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up, that way you never miss new videos from me. Two new ones every week, I've got merch and a Patreon, but also subscribe. You gotta subscribe if you wanna see all the new stuff. I was very excited that you were very excited to review the first episode of Haters Back Off, and I thought to myself, mama, no way am I going to watch this entire show, like every episode. It's just too much, because the show sucks. But I was willing to go all the way to the very end and try and fill in the blanks of what could have happened over the 14 episodes in between. And I'll tell you one thing, it was surprisingly uncomplicated. This show seemed like it had a very straight narrative right through, and we got some pretty generic plot points that were most likely served up as cliffhangers and twists, but that don't impress me much. By the way, you'll notice some new lights, backlight, and this light on the wall. It's because because I love lights, okay? I love lights and colors. You can tell right off the bat that by the end of season two, Miranda has one way or another made it to New York City where she seems to have been asked to perform at a big showcase. She also has a new manager. It's this guy holding a camera who also happens to be her estranged father. So apparently, I'm guessing sometime in the second season, he came back. Miranda is here recording a quick YouTube video and is giving her followers some tips on how to make it in NYC. If you ever want to go somewhere, you have to take something called a cab. When I saw a cab, I'd be like, hey, like that. And then the cab come. And those are always bright yellow cars, right? Or could it be that a number of those vehicles driving towards you are regular people who simply want to run you over after they catch one glimpse at those pirate wench facial expressions that Miranda Sings is always pulling? Like what was even supposed to be the funny part of improvising that boring dead end story about life in New York? Why was the most outrageous part of that narrative the number of creases your forehead was able to display? She's forever 
making these wrinkly ass faces. Whatever. In any case, I can really see that by the end of season two, Haters Back Off has really expanded on the scope of their story. It's the season finale and Miranda's finally made it to the Big Orange, which is this sort of New York City looking section of downtown LA that we see in the background. They try to sell it. She keeps referencing New York City landmarks that are off screen and we never see. Look at all of the taxis. That's the Empire State Building. Behold all of this dry piss. We can tell that her new manager, which is her dad. I know he has a name, but he's listed on IMDb as Miranda's father, so I'm not gonna try any harder than they do. Miranda's father doesn't quite get Miranda's whole thing. He's like, you barely finished your sentences. That was good enough to upload? It's like, this whole script was good enough to put into production? I know, I'm just as surprised. Miranda basically wanted to encourage her fans to come see her perform at that showcase tonight. Meanwhile, back at home, Miranda's mom and the creepy uncle who used to be her manager are discussing their current financial woes. Also, it turns out Miranda was basically kidnapped by her father and brought to New York without anybody's permission. And he took a bunch of their money so they can't make rent now. Jim, the uncle, has this brilliant idea to start crashing open the walls to find his hidden cash, which is a MacGuffin. They don't, it's not in there anymore. But when Miranda's sister, Emily, is called in to help, she sort of feels like this catharsis when she's holding that hammer. And we get a feeling that she's going through something emotionally with all of this. Wow, you can tell that must have been a very difficult scene for this young actress to film. Because of how the dry, tearless sobbing can cause a lot of cramping and muscle spasms in the face. I'm speaking from experience because I once had to fake cry for a role. I was playing the victim of my boyfriend who drove me to cheat on him by always being boring. That's when I learned the face isn't meant to contort in all of those sad ways without eye drops or real tears if I had actually felt bad about anything. Anyway, I got a Charlie horse on the left side of my jaw, and that's when Bradley dumped me. All because it was a serious conversation, and he thought that I was doing my impression of Jim Carrey in The Mask. Hey, you knew I was a slut when you met me, baby! My face was green due to sepsis. So anyway, we go into the uh, um, opening credits, the family is in trouble, whatever. Miranda and her dad are at this theater, where supposedly that showcase is happening tonight. The dad is trying to schmooze and introduce her to agents and all of this stuff. But first, they're talking to the owner of the theater. And when Miranda's away, he's like, oh, I invited her to see the show, not to actually take part in it. And it's like, <gasps> what kind of misunderstanding? So Miranda's big break is all for naught. They just wanted to invite a viral internet celebrity, I guess, to sit in the audience. But I don't think the dad wants to tell her that. Oh, if you remember Miranda's love interest from the first episode, he like drove an ice cream bike. He is now dating another girl who seems really sweet. They're at some Lord of the Rings inspired restaurant. So I'm very interested to see how, um, that triangle will develop. But first, we have to find out how Miranda's doing while preparing for her show that she thinks is gonna happen. Miss, there's no outside food or drink allowed in the Birdland Theater. Just based on my observations for the very first and very last entries for this series, I feel confident extrapolating that 16 out of 16 episodes featured at least one sequence where the humor was almost entirely based on the existence of penis-shaped foods and watching Miranda Sings shove those foods into her gross mouth. I guess I can get past the immaturity of all of this since clearly this show was made for kids aged public school 12 through homeschool 15, but why is it repeated so often? often. Why? Why is this the most consistent and important message that Colleen Ballinger wants us to take away from her show? Like, I think I, we get what you're trying to say, girl. You're either really bad or really good at giving blue jobs, depending on how much the smells like Burger King. Awesome, let me definitely buy my ninth grade child a ticket to go see that ethos played out on stage. You can tell throughout this whole series that they're also trying to prime the audience for Miranda's world tour, which she did in real life, I think straight off the back of this series. I guess it's a PG-13 show and that's why everything is a penis. Although, I guess I should also consider that these are not even oral sex innuendos. Could it be that in fact the real pig with too much makeup on is me? Also, I can eat a corn dog without hardly any chewing. Ugh, no, she just raised her eyebrows suggestively like an uncle does to an escort. She's being gross in real life. But honestly, I'm kind of relieved to just confirm that Miranda Sings is the 
hungry lipstick demon. Not me. Oh, by the way, today I'm wearing hungry lipstick in the shade Demon. Oh man, I think I just gave myself a context clue. Miranda's all excited that she's had got agents who are gonna watch her perform tonight, even though those agents are like, I'm gonna go. They don't seem to have much faith in her. The mom is then talking to Emily, who is really upset that dad left. She doesn't know what it's like to have a dad. She's feeling abandoned. She has no idea what it feels like to be in a family, and that's why she's hammering the walls. I would give you more about that subplot, but it literally resolves itself effortlessly by the end of this, so. Who cares? Finally, it's the night of the performance. Miranda has sat through all of these boring singers and she thinks she's ready to come on as the surprise guest when she has the shock of her life. But I have one last surprise. Put your hands together for Frankie Grande. In love, mind my business. I can't even sing. Miranda has no business telling Frankie Grande that he needs to improve his singing because he more urgently needs to improve his stage presence, song choice, and the proportions of his shoes, to his skinny jeans, to his sparkly blazer. But I don't mean to sound critical. Frankie has so much going for him on that stage, such as a spotlight, lots of personality, the eyeliner application of a lunch lady. We stan. I don't know what it is with Frankie Grande. His eye makeup always looks like he just sweated it right off, but that's not for me to say. I, I mean, I, it is, because I said it. Not for me to give you an answer to. I don't have the solutions. Get a Sephora gift card, I don't know. Miranda is not having this, so she gets up on stage and actually interrupts Frankie during his performance and just starts correcting him on all of the things she would be doing differently, which is getting laughter from the audience. And that's when the agent is like, oh, I get it. Why, why didn't you tell me that she is a comedy act? So do not look at his chesticles, everybody. I mean, she could be the next Andy Kaufman. Yeah, Andy Kaufman. I never thought of that. The bizarre, unpredictable responses, the weirded out audience members, the career improving prospect of faking one's own death. Colleen really could be the next Andy Kaufman. That's a very honorable comparison that people make in the comedy world so that men who are not that funny and kind of creepy still get credit for being a genius. Way to break the glass ceiling with that creepy Colleen. This is the type of show that leaves me so exhausted by how bad it is that I barely can make it off the couch by the end of it. But thankfully, my back aches and couch sleeping days are pretty much over since it's almost impossible for me to resist dragging myself to bed, especially with my Helix mattress. By the way, Helix Sleep is the sponsor of today's video and also the sponsor of my good dreams and healthy sleep. Helix makes premium mattresses that are customized to fit your needs, conveniently shipped to your door in this surprisingly small box. The mattress is rolled up and I just all by myself was able to unpack it and voila, my sleep was never the same again. Every body type is different and I loved being able to take Helix's sleep quiz in order to enter my preferences, my sleeping positions, my body type. For example, I'm a side sleeper through and through and I also run really hot. That's why it made perfect sense when Helix matched me with the Helix Midnight Luxe, including the Glaciotex cooling cover. I've had my soft yet also supportive fiberglass free Helix mattress for over a year now. And like, for example, my sister's staying over this weekend and she's using my bed and she says she loves Helix. I put her onto that sleep quiz. And personally, I wake up with less shoulder and neck pain, which was one of my main issues before. I don't have time to go to a mattress showroom and I don't have to because Helix ships straight to my door free within the US. And since there's no physical showroom to visit, you get a 100 night sleep trial to make sure you love your Helix mattress as much as I do. Not to mention your Helix sleep mattress comes with a 10 year warranty with plenty of financing options and payment plans so that everybody can get access to the best sleep of their lives. I love my Helix mattress and I know you would too. If you're looking for a new mattress, check out Helix Sleep. Their Labor Day sale is running now. It's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 25% off a Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash deramio to find out more about this limited time offer. You're gonna be sleeping soundly. It also seems like this scene is pretty pretty much meant to give people an idea of what to expect at a Miranda Sings live show, since what he, she's doing up there with Frankie really feels similar to the clips that I've seen since of the weird 
she pulls on stage. You'll get the same kind of exhausting comedy bits, the unwarranted touching of audience participants, and mm, that same tepid laughter from a barely conscious audience. Just imagine that instead of Frankie Grande having his chest groped on stage, it's a terrified local 10 year old who doesn't yet have the cognitive ability to process the embarrassment that's happening to him or how it's ensuring that he will grow up to be very, very gay. Baby, I was born this way, but it was cemented and crystallized when Colleen touched my boobs on stage. That's a new remix. The crowd loves Miranda. Frankie even is like, oh, that was fun. I guess I won't sing anymore because you just it up, but <laughs> you can tell Miranda or Colleen was really kind of just improvising a lot of this stuff where she's like, no, don't do that. That's like porn dancing. Like, okay, you suck, you suck. But you know, it's not so unfunny that an audience wouldn't chuckle to it. They're not laughing that hard though, even in the show. That's another area where I feel like producers were like, eh, she knows how to make Miranda funny. Let's just let her go. We don't need to write that part. It's like you do and you did. So back at home, Jim is all excited because they see in the news that Miranda took on that Broadway performance and really won the crowd over. However, Miranda's mom is like, her dad is a terrible person for stealing her. And Emily gets so jealous that she smashes the computer. And it's like, okay, the smashing thing is still happening. Love it. But back to Patrick. No, yeah, Patrick, the love interest of Miranda, who is now seeing this really pretty nice girl, Amanda. They start kissing and he's like, can you button up your shirt and put on a bunch of shitty lipstick? And she's like, you want me to look like Miranda? And so they break up because he realizes he wishes that he was with Miranda, which makes a lot of sense because you have a normal looking pretty person and a demon from hell with the face of a clown. Um, who wouldn't, who wouldn't make that choice? Patrick even accidentally breaks the picture that Miranda, I guess, gave him at some point over the series. And on the back, she had written, I love you. So it's, it's like a reveal. After her um, smash performance, a lot of talk shows wanted to have Miranda on, including this one, where clearly people think she's like just an actress putting on a like character, a la Colleen Ballinger does in real life. I am here with several famous YouTubers. <laughs> did I really say that? Yes, I did. How is that a thing? Can you actually be famous from YouTube? I think in the recent years we've seen people can absolutely become famous from YouTube, but it's a unique special kind of fame that at best only lasts for a few years before utterly destroying their personal life in a helicopter crash of scandal, disgrace, and drama. All of which they will escape from with a reasonably comfortable income thanks to their brand of vitamin enriched energy drinks and vaginal rinses that they'd launched just before it all fell apart. Miranda is apparently at this point in the show, not just delirious, she's also just rude. I didn't realize that in the first episode. She's really rude. And she's being rude to this talk show host who mistakenly thinks that she's some sort of actress. How did you come up with this character? What's your real name? Miranda. That's your actual name? What are you calling me, a liar? This woman is so boring. This isn't an act. Don't That's really me. her. Hey, don't beat yourself up. That's how young Hollywood works. Sometimes the media presents us with a genuinely funny, thought-provoking performance artist. And then other other times it's revealed that we've actually been laughing at a 15 year old child with a coincidentally hilarious array of mental challenges and poor supervision. That's why when choosing which celebrities to idolize, it's important to look out for the wolf in sheep's clothing or like the Gary Busey wrapped in the peeled off skin of Aubrey Plaza. Oh God, I'm one of the mentally ill ones, aren't I? Huh. The agent just realized, oh, Miranda's not an actress. She's like actually this kind of person. So he recommends they find a body double who looks like her who can play the normal actress who made up Miranda. And I'm just like, wouldn't it be easier just to train her to be normal in front of other people? Whatever, this is a weird decision that I can tell they were using to set up a third season, but oh no, it didn't happen. I'm so sad. We hire an actress that looks like you to pretend that she made you up. People like me being me. People think you're a joke. Well, Miranda Sings may be a joke to you, but not to me, because I think jokes need to be actually funny. And Miranda is certainly not a joke to Colleen Ballinger. To Colleen, a joke is a terrible statement about the texture and smell of her menstrual blood that she messages to a group of 12 year olds over Instagram during school hours. <laughs> she just likes having fun with her fans. And you know what, Colleen, Miranda, Ballinger, Sings, you have inspired an entire generation of people to believe 
believe that they can do anything and just call it a weird joke. So go forth and conquer, idiots and perverts of the world. Explain the word grundle to your oldest grandparent and then laugh heartily at their disgust. Find some neighborhood kids and then show them a Google image of a mucus plug. Guffaw at the slow dawn of their new traumatic memory. Life is a joke. A joke can be gross. Don't let me near your kids. That was just everything Miranda sings wants to f in this world, that song. So Miranda is mad that her dad wants her to take this sellout deal and pretend to be someone she's not or have someone else pretend to be her in a different way. So she heads back to the airport and she still wants to make her dreams happen. So she's vlogging the whole time. If you get hungry, you're gonna want snacks, but they do not let snacks through security. You have to hide them. Beef jerky, like so. And we'll be down like this. Once again, Colleen, we take your point. Sure, it might be more fun if penises were made of food. I don't think anyone here is like disagreeing with you or your beef jerky boner, but I swear it's like the writers of this show only had that one joke in their head. It's literally sad. No wonder the Writers Guild is on strike right now. These poor people were clearly forced to work while both extremely hungry and terribly horny. Because the family back home had been unable to find the money to secure their rent, they had to move out. For some reason, couldn't call Colleen and tell her. I guess they couldn't reach her because she was kidnapped, but they were like, Colleen's gonna come home and we won't be there because they had to move up to some attic. I guess they could rent a, someone's attic and it's cold and tiny, but Colleen does come home to an empty house and the only other person there is her father who is incensed that she threw away his opportunity to get rich off of her. Other than like the moment where Emily cried earlier, the show did feel equally as funny. I, I mean, like lighthearted as it always had, but they really are trying to give us some depth here, and I'm not sure I get it. How dare you drag me along only to back out when your pathetic little bratty self finally means something to me. Worthless. <laughs> that was the ghost of Stephen Sondheim bullying me back into the closet after I skipped the West Side Story remake on Disney Plus because my dad was watching Star Wars. I'm sorry, okay? Dads need to watch Star Wars seven times a year or they lose bone density and can't build decks as quickly. You'll notice with that Miranda's crying there, which again, these are not terribly talented actresses. I'm not 100% buying the sadness and the fear, but you'll notice the series has taken somewhat of a tonal shift over the second season. Most of the time, Miranda is like a happy-go-lucky, relatively one-dimensional character. But then we get these random explosions of emotional vulnerability, self-doubt, and sadness. I'm guessing this was supposed to make her obnoxious character a little more likable, which was such a stupid idea because who likes sad people? When I was a newborn baby, my mom struggled with postpartum depression and I was like, okay, sourpuss, I'm actually glad you haven't had the urge to pick me up in the last two months. Your vibe is trash right now. And she's never hugged me since because I don't deal with sadness. Luckily, the family comes to the rescue of Colleen. They pull her out of the closet and Jim punches the dad in the face and they are happily ever after. Oh, also Colleen runs out to see Patrick and they instantly hug. They don't kiss, they hug. And they kind of do this echo of the first time we saw them together in the first episode of the first season where he gets her the ice cream. Maybe they do kiss, I don't think, I don't know. There's something gross in her mouth at one point. So they admit their love for each other and then the whole family is up in that cramped attic eating their ice cream treats and watching television when they see Miranda's segment come on. Today we get to meet the hilarious actress who plays YouTube sensation Miranda Sings, Colleen Ballinger. Who the heck is that? Uh, I think they said her name was Colleen Ballinger, which I don't know, it might be Swedish for like girl with the Anne Hathaway understudy face. What? That's a compliment. I'm saying Colleen could have been a stand-in for Eponine in Les Mis, or even played one of the mean malnourished sex workers who pull her teeth out. That's a legitimate role. And that's a legitimate end to Haters Back Off, a show that I can see why it got canceled. That was a very unexciting ending. Like I guess the third season would have had Colleen enter the series playing herself as an actress who was hired to be Miranda's out of character version. Eh, eh, they were going meta with it. But to me, I feel like the sadder or more heavily emotional parts of this series felt under rehearsed, not super believable, and definitely unearned based on the way that the characters presented themselves throughout the series based on me seeing one other episode. What do you think? Could you tell why this was canceled? Did you watch it when it was on? I see kids on TikTok being like, this show makes me cry all 
all the time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll give you something to cry about, children. Ice caps melting. Sailors beating whales to death with sticks. Those are sad things. But let me know your sad things in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more Colleen Ballinger breakdowns. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. Turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm a sailor angrily beating a whale to death. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus episodes, virtual watch parties, and so much more. I'm gonna go on vacation this weekend to Big Bear, so I will see you all next time. You are all the greatest. Thank you so much for shoveling a phallic food into your face with me today. I will see you next time. <laughs>